Chapter 16, Crash and Burn Doctor, are you okay? asked the scrub tech. They were all staring at him, the circulating nurse, the anesthesiologist, and the tech. Um, yeah, I was trying to figure out if I need to insert distal fixation screws, he said. It was a lie to cover up his loss of focus. The tibia fracture was close to the knee and didn't require such screws. But that detail was too technical for anyone to know better. He shook himself and swung the sterilized stainless steel mallet again. Whacka, whacka. The sound of the mallet striking the rod reverberated off the gray tile walls of the operating room, and the rod drove deeper into the shaft of the tibia. Blood spurted from the wound with each strike, spraying red all over his surgical gown. An hour had passed, and he looked as though he were operating near the front line of a battlefield. Allow me, Dr. Rosedale, said the circulating nurse. He obeyed, setting the mallet on the instrument tray and stepped back. She stepped in with a folded towel and applied it to his forehead. Beads of sweat were absorbed into the cool dampness of the cloth, lifting his fatigue momentarily. He resumed the hammering, and the rod was driven into its proper place. The fluoroscope showed satisfactory alignment of the tibia fracture. It isn't perfect, he thought, but you can't make a silk purse out of a sew's ear. He always went for perfection, until lately. Why was he settling for just okay? He looked at the clock. It read 3.17 a.m. A deep dissonance washed over him and a feeling like his guts had been dropped in cold water. It made him draw his breath. Ugh, what is this? What's going wrong now? All I want to do is help people. Now I don't care. I don't care about anything. Damn, I might hurt someone. A terrible realization came, the realization that this would be his last surgery ever. He picked up the mallet and started to swing, then remembered he had finished and put it back down on the tray. Doctor? Doctor? Said the circulating nurse. She sounded anxious. He looked at her and saw that they were all looking at each other like frightened animals, their eyes darting back and forth. Can we close the wound, doctor? Uh, yes, of course. Suit your please. The scrub tech slapped the instrument into the surgeon's upturned hand, and in a few minutes, the wound was closed. Taken off the ventilator, the patient was transferred to the recovery room. Dr. Rosedale turned so the nurse could loosen the tie on his gown and peel the outer garments off. His biceps bulged in the short-sleeved scrub shirt, but his belly bulged more. A sign of success, so he had been told. On his way to the recovery room, he peeked in the mirror over the scrub sink and saw dark circles under his bloodshot eyes dark circles that had almost become festoons, and gray hair creeping up from his sideburns. His head drooped forward on his neck. Get your damn head back over your body, he muttered to himself. I'm going to look like the Pope and be stuck looking at people's feet for the rest of my life. In the recovery room, he wrote post-op orders and checked in on his patient, examining circulation and whether or not they could wiggle their toes. Then he went to the surgeon's lounge, where he was greeted by the smell of fresh donuts and coffee. The adrenaline was gone. Let's see what a dose of sugar and caffeine can do. The anesthesiologist, Dr. Steiner, leaned against a locker. A very tall, wiry young man with a crew cut. He looked like he belonged on a basketball court rather than in a hospital. He held a cell phone against his ear. Ah, there isn't anybody in my group who will come in at 4 a.m. and do the next tape. Yeah, yes, I'll be there on time. It's only an appendectomy. I'll get the kids to school. Yes, I know you have patients at eight. Yes, dear. Steiner snapped the phone shut. Hey, Brad, there's nothing worse than being a doctor married to another doctor, especially a pediatrician who doesn't have to take night call. You got me, said Brad. He wolfed down a cream-filled donut and was opening his locker. He made a silent prayer that he wouldn't fall asleep behind the wheel and kill somebody on his 20-minute drive home. Look, man, I don't want to sound judgmental, but you don't look good. Do you need help or anything? Want to talk? Asked Steiner as he bit into a multigrain bagel. The young anesthesiologist's ability to care about him at 4 a.m. after getting blasted by his wife for working all night was touching, but it also opened up an old wound that had been festering. He must know, thought Brad. They all must know. This is my third night here this week, and I've got a packed office every day, doing this grind for months, trying to clean up after Black screwed me and abandoned his patients. Easy for them to go home after their little eight-hour shift and live normal lives then come back and beg me to take more night calls and cover for the orthopedists on vacation. They must know they're killing me. No, I'm good, Brad said, trying and failing to sound energetic. Been one of those weeks. I, I just need a night off. Thanks for asking, Doc. Despite having worked several cases together, he couldn't remember the man's first name. 
God, my brain is fried. Okay, see ya, Steiner said and left to prepare his next case. Gulping down the coffee, finishing dressing, Brad shuffled through the chilly air to the doctor's parking lot. The drive home was a fight to keep his eyes open and stay in one lane. Nodding behind the wheel, he ran a stop sign, maybe two. Perhaps it was the prayer that saved him from crashing his BMW. It certainly wasn't the coffee. Before he succumbed to sleep, he set two alarm clocks to call Hannah, his practice manager, at 7 a.m. After two hours tossing and turning, he called her. Hello, she said. It's Brad. I have to cancel everything. His voice was groggy. What? Wait, cancel what? You sound terrible, she said. Hannah knew he was burned out, but she had been working hard to turn his practice around. It hit me at three this morning. Doing my third trauma case this week, I'm done. I have nothing left. If I keep going, I'm going to hurt someone. The words dragged out of him. Okay, Buster, let me deal with this. Stay in bed and get your rest. Do you need anything right now? No, thanks, he hung up. Hannah called the surgery and trauma call schedulers and his office receptionist, telling them he was ill and needed a few days to recuperate. Then she went to his house. He opened the door to the sight of her darting violet eyes and thick wavy black hair. At 40, she could pass for a 30-something Elizabeth Taylor. Hannah pushed into her boss's living room and closed the door behind her. You look like hell, she said. Drink this and let's talk. She handed him a styrofoam cup that smelled like five shots of espresso. When Hannah fixed a problem, there were no holes barred. It was why he'd hired her. Brad sat on the sofa in a bathrobe and sipped the drink, which gave him enough of a boost to have a conversation. I took you off the schedules at the hospital and closed the office for three days. Your orders are to stay in bed and rest. I will check on you regularly. Got it, Doc? That won't work. In a week, I'll be right back where I am now. As long as I take night call, I'm stuck with 90-hour work weeks. They won't let me off. I'll figure out how to lighten your load. You're too talented to give up. People need you. And besides, I've got money coming in now. Your success is in the bag. He nodded. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's see what happens. Hannah made an odd sight in her black patent leather boots, pleated skirt, and turtleneck sweater. She started gathering his clothing, which was strewn about, and grabbing dishes that clacked together as she put them in the sink. I'm going to get you some groceries and arrange for a housekeeper to come by and straighten things up. You're a successful doctor. You can't live like this. He wanted to tell her she was wasting her time. It was the success that was killing him, but didn't have the energy to say another word. He waited until she left to go back to bed and, despite the caffeine, drifted off to sleep. The next morning, Hannah let herself in. Brad could hear the rustle of grocery sacks and two women talking quietly. Things clinking on a counter, the refrigerator opening, more rustling. God, what on earth? You're in the same position I left you, but your sheets are halfway off the bed. She stood in the doorway of his bedroom, all dolled up and pretty, but in his mental torpor, he didn't think of her that way now. Rosa is your new maid, and she's about to start a vacuum cleaner. Are you okay with that? I don't care, he said, fighting off the urge to tell her to get the hell out. I need you to sign some stuff and basically let me have the rights to handle everything, okay? And take these goddamn pills so you'll feel better. Take one twice a day. And cover yourself up. She pulled a blanket over his body, which was no longer athletic. In the last couple of years, he hadn't seen the inside of a gym. The steak, cheesecake, and wine indulgences had added up. Instead of six-pack abs, he had a 12-pack. Or maybe a full case. Signed papers? Now he really wanted her to get the hell out. But he caught himself. Got to give her some credit. No one else bothers. He signed the papers without reading them. He was too fried to care about the fine print. The good news is that I've got a doctor who wants to rent space in your office. We can pay the rent while you get your rest. He can start this week. I can even get some of your patients to see him. He's a physiatrist. She hovered over him, clutching the papers, her violet eyes burning, her magenta lips forming a tight smile. The scent of her Chanel No. 5 that he'd once found sensuous now made him nauseous. Anyway, she wasn't dolled up for him. She was about to meet the new doctor to discuss how he wanted the office arranged. Is that all? Brad said. He couldn't wait for her to leave. When will that maid be out of here? Soon. Real soon. Sorry for the inconvenience, Doc. See you later. All she wanted was those papers signed. What's next? She turned on her heels and strode out of his bedroom. The clattering of utensils and housekeeping equipment as the two women prepared to leave annoyed him. 
It also gave him an uneasy feeling, and he was almost certain that she mumbled, don't thank me, as she closed the door behind her. Hannah was the first person in his life who cared enough to take on the task of making him successful. Money was coming in, and she'd replaced his two office girls with an experienced assistant who didn't flirt with the male patients or call to check on her family every 30 minutes. He had to trust her. There was no one else. Everyone who knew Hannah well had heard her story. A recovering heroin addict and alcoholic, she had come back from the brink of death. Telling her story had helped keep her clean and sober for more than 10 years. At AA meetings, she was merciless with anyone who relapsed, shaming them to tears or upsetting them enough to swear at her. Some even headed straight to the nearest bar. She'd invited Brad to a meeting where he watched it all unfold. It was the way she could best enjoy her authority. Driven out of bed to use the toilet, he looked around to see what the ladies had done. They had rushed out, leaving the place partly clean. But the refrigerator was stocked and fresh fruit sat on the counter. Next to the fruit was a big can of chicken and barley soup and a note. Eat this and take your pills. Two bottles of wine had been emptied. A note on the cabinet above them read, Stop this now. He hadn't touched alcohol in months, but her invasion had made him set the bottles on the counter just to annoy her. He threw the note down. It fluttered onto the living room carpet. He rummaged in the freezer for a half-eaten container of cookies and cream ice cream. Then he sat on the couch and finished the whole thing. The fat and sugar hit his bloodstream in a few minutes and dulled his brain. That was good because he wanted to break something or smash the wine bottles or maybe jump out of the fucking window. As penance for eating the ice cream, he went to the bathroom and popped several of the pills. He wasn't even sure what they were. Zoloft, Prozac, it was all the same crap. It didn't seem to matter. He was going to take enough to experience the side effects just to prove how useless they were. The next day, Hannah let herself in and didn't even bother to knock. He was in bed watching Star Trek reruns. What is going on here? She asked. Her volume faded quickly, as though she realized she was getting too critical. Hey, was all he had to say. Mr. Spock was his favorite guy. Imperturbable, with an answer for everything. Insufficient facts always invite danger, Spock informed his crew members as Hannah called out from the kitchen. You and that goddamn Star Trek. Hey, you didn't eat the soup. And I didn't leave this fruit here to decorate your apartment, dude. Her heels clicked out of the kitchen and onto the tiled bathroom floor. How much Prozac did you take? Half the bottle is gone. I took enough. I, they're worthless anyway. Hannah stood at the foot of his bed, well-dressed, her makeup and eyeliner meticulous, her thick black hair freshly styled. And yet he felt nothing. Hold out your hand, she said. He reached out towards her and watched his hand shake. You have a tremor. You overdosed. Do I need to get you admitted or what? She counted out two pills and put the rest in her purse. Then she got serious. Look, Doc, the money is running out. It's been two weeks since you've worked. We need to do something. When can you start seeing patients again? The money is running out. The words ricocheted in his head and bolted upright, as if hit by a shot of adrenaline. What? What? You said money was coming in. You have another doctor paying the rent. I'm not spending it. He turned in his bed, planted his feet on the floor, and started to get dressed. Not so quick, Buster. Let me explain. Explain? He had been screwed over by people paying money games. This better be good, he said. He mumbled under his breath, waiting for her answer. Standing up made him dizzy, and he almost fell while putting his pants on. That was the Prozac. He sat on the bed and waited for her to start talking and for the room to stop spinning. Dr. Murphy can't pay the rent until his collections come in. He applied for a practice startup loan, but it hasn't been approved yet. Your collections are coming in, but I had to take some extra for the long hours I'm putting in. You're broke, dude. I am opening the mail every day, hoping another surgery collection check will come in. But you screwed yourself taking all those extra trauma calls. Half the patients you operated on didn't have insurance. Something stunk bad. He got into his pants and a black polo shirt, walked out of the bedroom and sat down hard on the couch. The room swam, but he ignored it. I'm broke. Your new doctor can't pay his rent. And you gave yourself a raise? The blood throbbed in his temples and his face flushed hot. He felt himself tighten until he thought he would explode. Ugh, he said, leaning forward and grabbing his hair. It was a low groan, which he tried unsuccessfully to contain. He looked up and the empty wine bottles taunted him from the kitchen counter. 
Lunging off the couch, he flung himself towards them, raising one bottle high overhead and smashing it hard into the floor. He threw the other down so violently, he felt something tear in his shoulder. Shards of glass bounced from the tile floors, hitting the ceiling, the walls, his chest and legs, showering down everywhere. Oh, God! Hannah gasped as the first bottle crashed and broke into a hundred pieces. Ducking, she turned her pretty face away from the destruction. As the second bottle exploded into a thousand pieces, she protested, I didn't do anything! It felt good to break bottles and to scare the shit out of her, but he could have hurt her accidentally, and he didn't want to go that far. Are you okay? She responded to the sudden fear in his voice. I'm not hurt, but hell no, I'm not okay with this, she said, standing up and facing him. She pulled a tissue out of her purse and dabbed her eyes, although he didn't see any real tears. And then she started talking. She spoke about how hard she had worked to help him and how sorry she was about the bad things that had happened, beginning with the predatory Dr. Black and on through the office manager who defrauded him. While she spoke, she carefully got herself between him and the front door. He had calmed. Wanting to salvage the situation and perhaps dig up some truth, he said, Hannah, you are a great crisis manager, a skilled nurse, and I believe you wanted to help me. But I reviewed my financials a week before I stopped working and money was coming in then. If it's true that I'm broke, then you must have gone through tens of thousands of dollars in a few weeks. And that story about my storage locker, here you are, the only person with the key, telling me $50,000 of stuff is gone. Tell me more. Bang, bang. Uh, please, please open up. up. Hannah turned a shade of green and shrunk away. What now? Said Brad. He got up and opened the door to see two of Fremont's finest uniform officers. A large man with his hands on his hips and a smaller lady with fiery red hair and a baton in her right hand. Your downstairs neighbor said it sounded like gunshots went off in your apartment. Do you have a gun here? Asked the female. Uh, No, I don't. And it wasn't a gun. It was... He tried to find words that wouldn't get him in more trouble. I dropped a wine bottle on the floor. It hit hard and broke. May we come in and take a look? Said the large male officer. He must have been six and a half feet tall and over 300 pounds. Sure, said Brad, moving away from the door as they entered. They scanned the place with trained eyes. Brad was ordered to sit on the couch and not to move while the female officer took Hannah into another room to interview her. Uh, you been drinking, buddy? Asked the big man. Not a drop, officer. The bottles were already empty. The man finished his investigation and the women came back to the front room. The female officer called it in. We have a depressed doctor who may have gotten a little psycho about his finances and thrown a couple of wine bottles on the floor. His office manager is here and has talked him down. There are no weapons and nobody is hurt. She promised to keep an eye on him and get him some help. We'll let the neighbors know everything's okay. The officers left and Hannah swept up most of the glass. Wear your shoes. I'll have Rosa come over and clean the rest up. Don't don't bother. I I got it, Brad said. By the time the police were done, he'd put it all together. She was as good a bullshitter as she was a crisis manager. Are those new shoes? And what are you driving these days? You need to tell me the truth. He pushed her for the answers. The police visit had him on high alert and his mind was spinning. The shoes are not new. They're just well cared for. And I'm driving a Lexus. So is everybody else. Or like you with your BMW. What does that prove? She was arrogant now, as though the police getting called because of his outburst had exonerated her. Last month, you were driving a 10-year-old Camry. Nice upgrade. I'm sure I paid for it. It hurts to hear you say that, Doc. My Camry was stolen out of the parking lot at your office, and I made the down payment on my Lexus from my savings. Take your pills and call me when you feel better. She marched out and slammed the door. The officer, still parked down the street, watched her descend the stairs and disappear into the parking lot. I have a bad feeling, said the cop. She convinced her partner to watch for another 10 minutes. When there was no sign of further activity, they drove back to the station. Brad took his pills correctly this time and recalled that the medication could take a few days to kick in. That day, he watched TV until it bored him. Then he stayed in bed and ruminated about Hannah, unable to decide if she was giving him tough love or playing games with his money. Anybody capable of getting him so damn mad the cops were called couldn't be all on his side. The whole situation reminded him of the office manager who played him and took off with his money and Barney Black, who had seduced him into signing that rigged contract. He thought back to the day his conniving father, really just a lousy stepfather, tricked him into thinking he was helping his family by giving up the paper route money, and Mr. O taking advantage by feeling him up when they were alone together in the garage. All of them using me, playing me like a fool, 
while I was trying to do the right thing and help others. Damn them all. He was riled up and got out of bed to pace around, wanting to break something. He finished a box of donuts in the refrigerator, not tasting a single bite, trying to fill the black hole inside of him. Going to the bathroom, he popped a few of the pills, laughing darkly. This joke is on me, he said aloud to himself. The donuts and psychotropic drugs dulled his anger, and he fell asleep in front of the TV, shuffling into bed later. The next morning, he was awakened by a bright ray of sunshine that fell across the bed, and discovered he felt good enough to throw on some sweatpants and a t-shirt and go out for a walk. He ended up at a strip mall with a Barnes & Noble. He worked through his favorite sections, eventually making his way to psychology, where he found a couple of books on lying. One titled, Psychopaths Next Door, caught his eye. The idea of figuring out why people wanted to cheat him held his interest for a few minutes. But the self-improvement books were more interesting. Thoughts and Feelings, a cognitive behavioral therapy workbook, had exercises that looked clever and detailed but laborious. He didn't want to dig up all that right now. He was looking for a title that would jump out and inspire him. How do I get out of this hellhole my life has become? Aha, that would be a good title for a book. Then he saw it. Final Exit. The Compassionate Guide to Self-Assisted Suicide. Reading the front and the back of the book, a warm feeling bubbled through him. He took it straight to the register and bought it along with some Godiva chocolate bars. Then he went home to learn about the best way to end it all. The book uplifted him and he enjoyed the bird's musical singing outside. He heated a can of soup savoring the rich aroma of the hot and hearty chicken broth and the taste of barley on his tongue. He finished with a large serving of fruit, which he cut into slices and arranged in a colorful pattern on his plate before eating. I feel like a condemned man enjoying his last supper, he thought, and it made him laugh out loud, a real belly laugh. He was going to get them all back, all those people who had played him. He would make the final play. That would be a great title for the book he had just read. Final Play. He washed up and put on a clean button shirt, slacks, and dress shoes. He had to look good for the pharmacist who would fill his self-prescription for sleeping pills. Yes, they are for me. I'm having a hard time sleeping. A contract I signed turned sour and my office manager embezzled me. Nothing I can't get over. But I need to be fresh for the office every morning. Brad had rehearsed his pitch a dozen times and it went exactly as planned. The bags under his eyes were real and made it convincing. Okay, Dr. Rosedale, I can fill you this once. I have filled prescriptions for some of your patients, and I know how busy you must be. But if your sleep pattern doesn't improve, be sure to get some professional help. You got it. Thank you. There was no law broken, and the pharmacist had no idea the doctor had been given medication for depression and anxiety. He had gone into an ethical gray zone, but it wouldn't matter for long. After exiting the pharmacy, Brad entered a liquor store three doors down, where he bought a fifth of 80-proof stock Naya vodka. Two hours later, the downstairs neighbors heard a big thud above their ceiling and called 911. Dispatch sent out a call for nearby police officers. Neighbors heard a loud noise again over on Santa Clara Avenue, same colors as last week. We got it. That's our doctor, returned the officer with fiery red hair. I have more than a bad feeling now, she told her partner. Bang, bang. Went the male officer's heavy fist. Police, open up. Bang, bang, bang. Kick it open, said the redhead. A large booted leg raised and thrust forward with enough force to break the door open. The female officer rushed in with her gun drawn. Then she holstered it. Call the paramedics. Brad lay on his stomach in the kitchen, a plastic bag halfway on his head. An empty bottle of vodka and a pill bottle were on his bed. The only article of clothing he wore was a soiled pair of briefs. She found a sluggish pulse. I think he's still alive. Turn him over. The big male officer lifted the unconscious man's shoulders and gently rolled him onto his back. The officers weren't sure if they should initiate CPR, as he was breathing shallowly. His pupils weren't dilated, but he was cold and clammy. Fortunately, the paramedics arrived in record time and went into action. They had the victim intubated and an IV started in less than a minute. They carried him down the stairs in a stretcher, an officer following them and squeezing the bag to get air into Brad's limp body. 